How do you talk about s.t.a.l.k.e.r. Shadow of Chernobyl as a fan without smashing into hyperbole? Probably the same way you'd talk about Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, minus the copyright lawsuit. Stalker was a fresh IP from developer GSC Game World, which rocked the gaming scene in March 2007. Despite its tumultuous development cycle and persistent post-launch bugs, Stalker became a cultural phenomenon and cast a long shadow which persists today. I was one of those scrubs in the early 2000s who salivated over each video and screenshot of Stalker's long development. It wasn't the wealth of boasted features, the fearsome mutants, or the physics-crushing anomalies which hooked me. They were great, but there were other equally alluring elements. Chernobyl was a mysterious and unknowable entity, and the more I saw of it, the more I had to know. It was as if the zone were already calling to me, and I had begun lacing my thick-soled shoes, stuffing a backpack with tinned food, and stitching a radiation patch onto my arm in preparation. I was ready, so I thought. Running my fingers across the stamped radiation logo on the collector's tin was the beginning of what became an ongoing obsession. Stalker was a breath of fresh Slavic air in the rapidly homogenized Western market. We weren't there yet, but even back then we were well on the way as business models were refined and investor demands increasingly guided the creative process with a firm, gilded hand. Slavic developers have a different approach to game design, and while I enjoy a Gopnik meme as much as the next Bogan, I've always found the term Slavjank reductive from a creative sense. Their view of the world has inspired great ideas, ideas which Western developers lack, and these should be embraced. For the pedants already clacking out Stalker's list of bugs, I'm talking about the creative process, not technical execution. That's another topic. Stalker's world was fresh and exciting at the time, especially when compared with shooters of the era. Its gameplay blurred the line between genres in a way which hadn't gripped players since the turn of the century. The setting was grounded by real-world locations, lending an air of plausible authenticity to it and evoking reflection on the catastrophe which fractured this place decades ago. Stalker was unlike anything people had seen before, and this drew curiosity from gamers who might not otherwise have been interested. Calling Shadow of Chernobyl influential is to say that water is wet, the sky is blue, and that vodka cures radiation sickness. Hey, hot kranskis and sauerkraut heal bullet wounds, so who am I to judge? I could cite a litany of games which have borrowed heavily from Stalker, or cite quotes of direct inspiration, but that isn't the focus of this video. This analysis explores what Stalker was at release by examining the components to determine how this game's haunting siren song called to so many. Why was the gravity of Stalker's setting impossible to escape? What did players find if they persisted past the tough early game? And why was this struggle important to Stalker's identity? What legacy has Stalker cultivated in the wake of Shadow of Chernobyl? These questions, and many more, will be answered. I'm an old-school Stalker fan. I've loved this series since Shadow of Chernobyl's release. Between the original games and the Stalker Anomaly and Stalker Gamma mod packs, I've clocked thousands of hours in the zone. I'm biased about Stalker, but this is an analysis, and I'll set that aside to ensure that criticism is given where it's earned. Having said that, many grasp the wrong end of Stalker's shtick, and I want to state a case for why many find it an addictive experience. I'm always transparent with bias so that you can decide how much Kool-Aid I'm drinking. I feel as though I'm fair, even when I advocate for something I love. A brief aside before I continue. If you enjoy my work and want to support the channel, then consider checking my Patreon. Link is in the description. Patrons get monthly updates, their name in the credits, and other benefits, like a bespoke digital copy of the video script as a way of saying thanks. Patrons are glittering artifacts clutched to my breast, but I treasure you all. I'd also be grateful if you subscribe, thumb the video, and drop a comment to tell me how I did. The spirit of Susan ain't gonna reach through your screen and strong arm you into clicking subscribe, so help Blondie out. Secure those loose straps, clean your papa's pre-war pea shooter, and grab your favorite radiation purging tipple. We're heading deep into the heart of the exclusion zone to uncover its dark secrets. Only the bravest stalkers will survive. Welcome to the conversation, and good hunting, stalker. Game development is rarely a straight line from start to finish. There's challenges to overcome and ideas which don't work out and must be discarded. Fixing these things requires great efforts and, on occasion, a revised iteration of the final game. Stalker's development was particularly troublesome. It didn't ship in a state which reflected GSC Game World's original vision. 
Stalker's development officially began in the year 2000 as a project called Oblivion Lost, but it wasn't until November of 2001 that Stalker Oblivion Lost was publicly announced. GSC were an ambitious studio eager to prove themselves by launching a title so explosive that the blast crater was visible from orbit. Their real-time strategy series, Cossacks, had done well, but GSC wanted to shift gears into the FPS market. They had already dipped their toes in with Venom, codename Outbreak, GSC's first shooter, released in November 2001. The game was lukewarm with critics, but GSC were undeterred. From GSC developer Anton Bolshikov during an interview with Rock Paper Shotgun, quote, We set our mark very high. The game ought to be the best in everything. We targeted creating the best engine, attaining realistic graphics, developing innovative concepts, and delivering innovations to the genre. End quote. Lofty goals for sure. The team drew inspiration from the 1979 movie Stalker by director Andrei Tarkovsky. The Stalker movie is derived from the 1972 Russian novel Roadside Picnic by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, another source of inspiration for GSC. I'll discuss these influences in detail later in the analysis. Half-Life, System Shock, Deus Ex, and the Fallout series were cited as gaming influences during Stalker's development. After the Chernobyl incident, Soviet influence bled from Ukraine. It left a legacy of abandoned buildings, catacombs, and military facilities. GSC's office was a refurbished military factory. These pockets of former Soviet power, slowly rotting with the inevitable whims of time, struck GSC as a cool backdrop for players to explore. From the beginning, GSC knew that anomalies, artifacts, and cheeky breaky energy had to be in Stalker. But the setting didn't coalesce until 2002 during their fateful visit to Chernobyl's Exclusion Zone, a 30km area around Chernobyl severely affected by radioactive fallout. The team dutifully photographed and documented every detail. Almost every building in Shadow of Chernobyl is modelled and textured from real buildings documented during this excursion. Colourful urban myths about the reactor explosion sprouted from the old military facilities and the suffocating secrecy the Soviets enforced to control their empire. Rumours grew from an idea that the Chernobyl nuclear power plant housed secret underground laboratories and that the 1986 explosion was caused by an experiment mishap. Other legends grew from the Duga radar, a massive antenna system visible over the Chernobyl skyline. A rumour persisted that the antenna emitted psychoactive waves which were directed into Western Europe this experiment was supposedly testing psychotropic influence on humans. Then, of course, there was the plant itself, already an ominous, daunting presence. One of the more famous images of GSC's visit to the exclusion zone features the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the background, its visitors fitted with face masks, hairnets, and long khaki trench coats. Look closely, they were well prepared. Hello, cheeky bricky. Whatever stories GSC were told about the Chernobyl incident, the aging sarcophagus, a cover erected over the destroyed reactor 4 to prevent radiation escaping, that sarcophagus surely hammered home the danger of the location. The potency of these legends was too rich for GSC to drop. Real world intrigue became fertile soil for Stalker's story to take root. GSC had found the setting for their game. Oblivion Lost initially featured 15 linear levels, akin to the classic shooter formula. Chernobyl changed that vision, metaphorically blew it up and out. GSC wanted a huge 30km squared zone for players to explore. This area was split into distinct open world locations and populated with NPCs which utilised a feature the team had never seen in shooters. NPCs would eat, sleep and move about the zone pursuing their own goals. This simulated life, a life as it became known, would be proprietary technology which GSC hoped would remain relevant for over a decade after Stalker's release. A-Life was a cornerstone of Stalker's technical identity, even this early in development. With a robust concept and lofty goals to meet, GSC was almost ready to scribe their vision in code. Before they could commit to Oblivion Lost, they needed a publisher to believe in their concept and back development. In short, they needed cash. But there was a problem. GSC was a small development house operating out of Ukraine. They had trouble getting noticed by big publishers, and likely felt they'd have more luck having their backyard barbecue fire noticed from space. But GSC had an ace up the sleeve. This trick had secured funding for Cossacks, so there was no reason to think it would fail now. What was the ace up the sleeve? They exaggerated their claims about Stalker. GSC's PR manager at the time, Oleg Yavorsky, admitted during an interview with Eurogamer that the goal was to promote the concept, to overhype it, in his words. Their strategy worked. Publisher THQ noticed the buzz around the project and cut them a deal. It was time to walk the talk. 
This is where the real problems began. GSC quickly realized that many of their ideas wouldn't work. While there were likely multiple factors which caused GSC to rethink their promises, I reckon that technological limitation and a lack of developer experience with the proposed features were among them. A-Life alone would have been a monumental undertaking whilst also learning GSC's new game engine, built from the ground up. Stalker's development slowed as the team went through arduous trial and error solutions and constant redesigns. The slow pace and frequent setbacks resulted in Stalker's release being pushed back multiple times. Stalker's loyal fanbase slowly fractured, some souring on GSC in the constant delays. The initial hype which had secured a publishing deal and won fans the world over was now a noose tightening around GSC's neck. Their woes had only begun. In 2003, after GSC announced Stalker's delay, on the day of Stalker's original release date, an incomplete build of Stalker was leaked to the public. Oleg Yavorsky spoke of the incident in a Eurogamer article. Quote, it started on a forum somewhere, but then it spread like wildfire. The links to the build started spreading. We were trying to cut it down by deleting the link, but it's the internet. It's impossible to stop." End quote. GSC watched in horror as years of toil spread through communities eager to see what the team had accomplished. Yavorsky states, quote, We had never experienced a situation like this. It was really stressful. It was really unpleasant. End quote. While it was a horrible experience for the team, fans were so thrilled with the early build that some falsely believed it was a PR stunt to generate more hype. The instigator of GSC's pain wasn't hackers or disgruntled employees, but a simple careless mistake of uploading an unprotected build of Stalker to an FTP site, which fans sniffed out. Fans and the gaming media reveled in this new exposure, but they weren't the only ones paying close attention. THQ saw the leak, and they were much less impressed. Where they had been content to leave GSC to their own devices, THQ now felt they needed more oversight on their struggling investment. GSC languished with Stalker's development until 2005 when THQ finally stepped in. Stalker's original and revised release dates had come and gone, yet there was still no light at the end of the development tunnel. THQ's money was being sucked into a whirly gig anomaly. Four years was a long time for a game to be in development back then, especially with no end in sight. GSC were officially stuck in development hell. Unbeknownst to GSC, THQ had a plan, and it hinged on this guy. His name is Dean Sharp, and he reminds me. You remind me. This blonde-haired Chad Kroger upgrade would soon be employed by THQ, though he didn't know it yet. Sharp was forced to close his game studio, Big 8 Productions, a few years prior to 2005. He was a laid-back guy who enjoyed his privacy and had been laying low since then, contemplating the next move. Jack Sorensen, Sharp's friend and executive vice president of THQ, invited him out one day and the two caught up over a growing pile of wine bottles. It was then, a couple of bottles in, that Sorensen made his soft pitch. There was this cool Ukrainian development house who was struggling with a project. Wouldn't it be great if Sharp went over and helped them back on track? In Sorensen's estimation, Sharp was an excellent people manager and he knew how to close projects. He also couldn't resist a challenge, a trait which Sorensen appealed to. Sharp, who was used to shooting the shit with Sorensen, believed that all this was wine talk, shooting the breeze for the sake of wind, so he jokingly took the offer. The following morning, when the THQ office called looking for passport details, Sharp realized that Sorensen had been serious. Sharp had volunteered himself. Dean Sharp was the quintessential fish out of water the moment the plane landed in Kiev. It was bitterly cold, a sensation likely unfelt to such a punishing degree by a sun-kissed Californian. Sharp didn't speak a word of Russian, before the time of translation apps and smartphones as we know them. He was out of his element, in the elements, and he wanted to go home. The discomfort had barely begun. GSC's office was austere. The walls were largely devoid of posters and pictures, and desks were bare of character, containing a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. Sharp recalls that the office felt like a hospital, clinical and without personality. He went to the bathroom and glanced out the window, and it looked like a scene from Stalker, he said. GSC were less than exuberant that Sharp was there. He was a foreigner, come to their office to mess with their game. Sharp wasn't just an outsider, he was THE bad guy, a physical manifestation of crushed dreams, and he knew it. Years earlier, Sharp had thrown a guy out of his office for doing what he was about to do. Literally, thrown him out of the office by force. Unsurprisingly, GSC staff didn't take a shine to Sharp, which made cutting to the core of their problems difficult. Sharp was only there for two weeks to assess if Stalker was salvageable, but he couldn't leave fast enough. 
he recounts it as the worst two weeks of his life. He told his good friend, Jack Sorensen, that he was never going back. Sharp did go back to help GSC finish their game. Sorensen knew his friend well. Sharp couldn't walk away from a challenge. GSC initially resisted until Sharp gave them the pointy end of the deal. No more handouts from THQ. They'd receive no more money until the game shipped. If they didn't like it, they could fix their own damn game. The ultimatum shook GSC awake, and they realized the depth of their dilemma. With the team now receptive to outside help, Sharp got to work. Features were ruthlessly axed. Shadow of Chernobyl lost a region, additional mutants, vehicles, and a sleep feature, among others. Cutting the sleep feature was hotly contested by fans, so much so that Sharp received daily death threats. Some threats were credible enough to involve authorities. Cutting the sleep feature removed half the entire list of Stalker's existing bugs. Whether you like this decision or not, removing it made sense when the goal was to get the game out the door. Isn't it heartwarming to know that death threats over a video game aren't a new shame for the gaming community? I've left out details, so check out the Eurogamer article about Dean Sharp's involvement with Stalker. It's a great read. Link is in the description. IGN published an article in April of 2006, during Stalker's cut and polish phase, showcasing titles which had been in development so long that they were considered vaporware. Stalker was among them. Faith that Stalker would see the light of day was still shaky among critics and gamers, but that didn't stop strange catchphrases like Oblivion with guns from catching on. <sighs> Oblivion doesn't have vodka. Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, finally released in March of 2007. It had been a marathon effort to reach this point. Oleg Yavorsky recalls that the team was exhausted and anxious. In their estimation, Stalker would either be a smash hit or a complete flop. After release, fans were divided, according to Oleg. They either loved it or hated it. But the critical reviews were positive, which must have been a relief. Despite the setbacks and long development, GSC were finally done. The zone was unleashed upon an unsuspecting world. There's preamble required before we get into gameplay. You can't talk about Shadow of Chernobyl without at least brushing the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster. Beyond the immediate effects of the explosion and resulting cleanup, this infamous event irrevocably shaped the region geopolitically, economically, and culturally. While the details are hotly debated, this singular event is cited by some as the catalyst which dissolved the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, and emboldened many countries neighboring Russia to reclaim independence. There are many great sources on the history of the Chernobyl incident which dive into heart-aching detail, so I won't go into it. If you haven't played Shadow of Chernobyl, I recommend reading about the Chernobyl disaster first. It layers real-world depth to the setting which conspiracy could never hope to capture. Imagine the rows of rusted vehicles filled with despondent women and children. Care to guess why these vehicles were left in their own graveyard? The horror these people were exposed to bonds the player to the world in a way which few games can match. Let's dive into the setup and first impressions. In Shadow of Chernobyl, a second blast emanated from the Chernobyl power plant in April 2006. No, it wasn't caused by IGN's bombshell vaporware article. Shortly afterward came reports of strange physics-altering anomalies appearing throughout the exclusion zone. Those who went in to investigate and lived returned with odd misshapen artifacts which exhibited unsettling powers. These treasure-hunting daredevils became known as Stalkers. The titular acronym is commonly accepted as standing for Scavengers, Trespassers, Adventurers, Loners, Killers, Explorers, and Robbers. I contest this definition, and I'll explain why in the story section of the analysis. Stalkers are a mixed bunch who come from all walks of life. The good, the bad, and the ugly enter the zone seeking wealth, happiness, answers, and even solitude with a Nimirov chaser. Stalkers are like you and I, but with worse healthcare. Stalkers spread throughout the zone, establishing camps and branding their presence among the crumbling vestiges of humanity. Common-minded people formed factions and built communities with a sense of brotherhood in the Ukrainian wilderness. While not all factions get along, they all keep a wary eye on the well-equipped Ukrainian military who view stalkers as pests and shoot on sight. Not even the grain of absolute truth can appease these pricks. Hideously mutated creatures call the zone home, prowling the plains and underground laboratories, hunting for an easy meal. Careless stalkers never leave the menu. They're a grotesque yet fickle bunch in the southern areas, but encounters with new mutants grow increasingly terrifying and dangerous as the player tracks north. 
There's no other experience like being hunted by invisible bloodsuckers through the ruins of a village. Mutants play to the warped reality of the zone, a malicious reflection of real-world latent fears and legends of the region, spawned from the nightmares of its people. Mutants have overgrown limbs, blistering sores, and, with some, a disturbing visual genealogy with humans. This perversion of mankind, this inherent body horror, is what makes Stalker's mutants iconically repulsive. It plays against old fears of the effects of radiation exposure, which persisted into the 2000s. Radiation, to the layman, is akin to dark magic, with the ability to twist and warp the human body. In 2007, I knew that radiation couldn't do this to a human body, but my imagination wanted to believe. Buying into the illusion is crucial. Then there are the anomalies, deadlier than any living creature thanks to their proliferation and difficulty spotting. One misstep could turn you into a human Rubik's Cube, but stalkers willingly brave anomalies to recover the best artifacts. Anomalies are always a challenge, whether it's learning how to identify them early in the game or learning how to expertly navigate them later in the game. What I just described is Shadow of Chernobyl's setting in a nutshell, a masterful apocalyptic backdrop which combines the organic components of friction and survival in a seamless presentation. Let's crack the nutshell and see what's inside. Stalker's world feels alive in a way which precious few games capture. GSC's new X-Ray engine featured dynamic wet surfaces and real-time global illumination, which looked good for the time, allowing a deeper, more realistic play on light and shadow. The A-Life system, Stalker's crown jewel, controlled every NPC and gave them individual purpose. NPCs would eat, sleep, congregate around fires, hunt mutants, fight rival factions and migrate across the zone. It didn't matter whether the player was in their region or not, A-Life controlled all NPCs at all times. I grow more impressed thinking about this accomplishment. Mutants had realistic behaviours, resting, attacking in packs, fleeing if the pack was culled and snacking on fresh carcasses. This behaviour was dynamic and unscripted, an uncommon quality at the time. Stalker's wealth was highly reactive instead of prescribed. If the player heard distant combat, they could head over to witness the aftermath or intervene if the fight hadn't ended. Most of us would let them wipe each other out so we could walk away with the loot, let's be real. Clashes between man and mutant play out in sounds of distant battle which echo and roll across the land. The rattle of gunfire, a growl, a scream of pain. The soundscape is alive with activity, broadcasting its horror for all to hear. It's a great touch, which always holds the tension at a deliberately uncomfortable level. If that wasn't enough detail, stalkers grew annoyed if the player had their weapon out while walking around camps and would even fire on them if they didn't put their weapon away. This detail reminds me of Gothic in the best possible way. Put the damn weapon away! Lucky for you, but I would have enjoyed polishing your mug. Like Gothic, Stalker also has a dynamic day-night cycle, which give human movements meaning within the world. The cloud shadows drifting across the land were an inspired touch, a detail I never tire of in Stalker. This is all framed by a brooding soundtrack which belongs in any Apocalypse playlist. The tone of each track perfectly captures Stalker's bleak setting with thrumming bassy drones and low-tempo drawn-out synth chords, which are as sinister and creeping as the mutated monsters. Shadow of Chernobyl is exemplar of a perfect synergy between soundtrack and game. Composer Frey Vladimir, aka Muse, nailed the ambience and hostility of this setting. The tracks wail pain, loneliness, suffering, biting cold, nihilism, and hidden terrors, yet capture fleeting warmth, hope, and determination. The tracks extend beyond the game and reach for the essence of the real-life exclusion zone, dragging from it all the pain and anguish it has caused. Many of these tracks are now iconic of the series and appreciated as standalone art by like-minded audiophiles. I'd love to use Stalker's tracks as backing music for the video, but I know from experience that at least two are copyright and it's not worth the hassle. There are Shadow of Chernobyl playlists on YouTube. Look them up. They're worth the effort. Stalker's character models looked good for the time. Detailed textures and skeletal animation brought NPCs to life and gave them a distinct personality in Stalker's world. Watch a bandit swagger and you'll know what I mean.
Buildings and environments looked incredible, crafted and textured from the source images of GSC's Exclusion Zone trip. They looked authentic and real, as though they belonged precisely where they stood. This formed a cornerstone of Stalker's ongoing appeal, the authenticity of its world. GSC captured what the zone was, from the roots up. There was character and story to every pile of radioactive scrap and every dilapidated building. These places had function beyond the game world, which was intimately felt while exploring. It was easy to imagine military trucks rolling into a vehicle yard for a service, or buses ferrying excitable kids into Pripyat for toffee apples at a summer fair. Stalker's first impressions are quaint, in a desolate way. Let's discuss how the game plays. Shadow of Chernobyl's difficulty has a reputation which precedes it. New players are frequently warned about the difficulty before they play. Imagine lying defenseless on the ground while someone stomps your crotch. Now imagine that someone is Shadow of Chernobyl, and every stamp of the boot is a lesson you needed to learn. There are several factors which contribute to Stalker's overbearing early game. Let's discuss the difficulty setting first. This topic is interesting, it still divides the Stalker community. Some claim that Shadow of Chernobyl is best experienced on Master Difficulty, the hardest difficulty. The reasoning is that enemies take more damage and are easier to kill. The player also takes more damage, but the trade-off is worth it due to a perception of spongy enemies. That's the claim. It's hard to draw an accurate conclusion on what Stalker's difficulty setting does. There are arguments from both extremes about whether the previous statement is true. The more compelling arguments are from people who reportedly dug through Stalker's files and supplied raw data showing what difficulty does. Is that the full picture though? I hear that some settings and values are coded into Stalker's executable file and are considered untouchable by the modding community. Is it possible that difficulty settings are additionally altered here? To muddy the waters further, the manual states, quote, The game difficulty alters how fast the player can be killed and how many useful objects can be found in the game. End quote. My opinion? I don't have empirical evidence to support or deny the claim, and getting it would be a big undertaking. Play on whatever difficulty you like. If you're new to Stalker, an easier difficulty is a better option. I played on Master Difficulty for this video, and I must have been shooting licorice bullets for all the rounds my targets ate. I'll explain in detail soon, there's more to this equation than a difficulty setting. GSC said that they wanted to gift players as much freedom as possible and let them decide how they wanted to play. That energy is felt immediately when starting a new game, as players are given a brief introduction from local loan shark Sid, then hustled outside. The player has no gear, they must talk to another NPC to retrieve it. Stalker is an uncompromising survival light experience, and a few things become quickly apparent. There are only two weapon slots, one for pistols and another for a primary firearm like shotgun or assault rifle. Weapons and armor degrade with use and can't be repaired. They must be replaced or they'll begin to jam, in the case of guns, or provide less protection in the case of armor. The player must also eat periodically. This provides a small health boost, otherwise affects nothing beyond avoiding a game over screen. Players will bleed if a wound is severe, and they must bandage the wound to stop blood loss. The stamina meter is as valuable as bullets and medical supplies. Playing chicken with a bloodsucker and running out of puff will make your sphincter tight enough to crush diamonds. Stalker's resource and inventory management is one of the finer aspects of survival. It demands constant assessment of player aptitude and resiliency against the unknown. Item management is always required, even once the player is adequately geared, thanks to a hard weight limit. The player can't act as a portable vendor, hoarding items and weapons with loot goblin lust. Encumbrance affects stamina drain, and if the player exceeds their max encumbrance by 10 kilograms, they can't move. Hard decisions must be made about what to carry and what to discard. Players can, and should, hoover all loot early for maximum cash, but they're taught to become discerning over time. A PDA acts as map, task list, and encyclopedia, and it's as invaluable as any gun or bandage. New players may be quick to dismiss it, but veterans understand that it's a valuable reference. Some of these lessons are learned in the opening minutes, some after hours of play, but they all must be understood as requirements for survival. There's no way to know much of this in the beginning. Stalker is notoriously rough on new players. Information appears as situations arise, such as taking damage, bleeding, or hunger, 
but it's easy to miss while you're having your face chewed off and quickly disappears. It also doesn't cover many actions a player should take to ease them into the experience. Medical items like bandages and medkits are hard to get in the early game. Players collect a pistol and a couple boxes of ammo from Wolf. No healing items, no radiation purging items, niet vodka. Supplies are exorbitantly expensive and they're a rare find in the wild this early. That means at the beginning of the game, a single hit can cause life-threatening blood loss if it doesn't kill immediately. It's a hell of a hello when the first tasks are to cull the mutant population and rescue a loner from a bandit camp, both risky jobs for a greenhorn. Again, I'm reminded of another uncompromising world. Welcome to the colony. There was not only tolerance, but acceptance of this design in mid 2000s. It may seem archaic now where games lead players into the intro tango step by step with detailed tutorials, tips, and entire manuals built into the UI. This was an era where players were encouraged to read the manual, and where game design could still afford to be risque about informing players of the world and its rules. I'll also point out that the mechanics are detailed in the manual and on-screen tips, it's the semantics of design, the implication and application of these systems, which are never explained. There's no shorthand, it's trial by fire, it's left for the player to discover. It's easy to label this design as outdated, yet Escape from Tarkov has a similar, arguably more brutal approach and is wildly successful. Many respected survival games leave much for the player to discover. That's part of the inherent magic and mystery of these worlds, and it hooks players. Scant resources force players to be picky about who they pick on. Attacking a well-armed military outpost with a PM pistol and delusions of power is as foolhardy as setting fire to a lion's tail. Fighting mutants hefts equal weight. They don't shoot back, but there may be many of them, and they don't go down easy. Is it worth spending a whole clip on one creature? Is it worth the risk of getting mauled and burning through precious medical supplies? It's a hard question to answer, but it's one which all players are asked with each encounter. Circling back to the difficulty dilemma, there's a common perception that enemies are spongy, particularly in the early hours. There's truth to this, most notably with weapons like the AKM-74, which is chambered for the respectable 5.45mm round, yet feels as dangerous as a mosquito kiss. The underlying problem is twofold though. The first issue is weapon damage. The damage of the weapons players have access to early on is artificially scaled down to maintain a progressive power arc. Stalker doesn't want players getting powerful too early. This leads to laughable imbalances like the Viper 5 submachine gun, chambered for the 9x19mm round, feeling more accurate and powerful than the AKM, even in single fire mode. The second issue is accuracy. Accuracy is also scaled back to retain the power arc. Starting weapons are hopelessly inaccurate, well beyond the shortfalls of their real life analogue. I've aimed farts with more precision than some of Stalker's weapons. Headshots are devastating, but tough to land consistently before the wild territory region. The combination of slightly spongy enemies, underpowered weapons, and horrible accuracy in the early game create an impression of underwhelming gunplay. There are few alternatives, meaning the player is stuck with these weapons until options broaden. A counterpoint to this issue is to play with the weaknesses instead of railing against them. The cure, and the solution Stalker expects, is close quarters battle. While you won't be John Wicking through the exclusion zone, combat is more potent up close. Accuracy matters less when the target is closer and you've got a better chance of landing a critical headshot. This makes combat deadlier for the player too, which creates deliciously tense shootouts and cat and mouse hunts as combatants try to outmaneuver each other. One shot can end it, especially if someone has a shotgun. The lone caveat to this counterpoint is the arena fights in Rostock. Players can volunteer to fight in the arena to earn cash. These fights often handicap the player, and the later fights are stilted so heavily that the issues of spongy enemies, underpowered weapons, and dogshit accuracy are brought into severe contrast. The player is also expected to fight with basic armor and weaponry, while opponents are terminators with modern rifles, one or two shotting the player. It's a miserable time on Master Difficulty, and I gave up fighting the stacked deck of crippling contrivances. Thankfully, most fights in the zone offer more options than the arena. Let's talk about the knife. Wait, what knife? Uh, let's check the inventory. No, nothing there. Tool tips? No, no pop-ups either. How the hell am I... Oh, there's a keybind. But there's no knife in my inventory. What happens if I press the knife key anyway? 
Are you kidding me? Really game? This is one of the more confusing weapon introductions I've seen. Unlike knives in other shooters which are relegated to bum crushing fallback weapon, Stalker's knife is critical to exploration. It's sometimes useful in stealth, I'll discuss that soon. These crates and containers are littered throughout the zone. Sometimes they contain a random sprinkle of loot. The best way to break them open is with the knife. It's not the only way, I see you Stalker fans, but it is the best way. Why is a fundamental part of Stalker's exploration loop never mentioned in the tutorial tips? If players knew this right away, it would make the start less ball crushing. The knife is surprisingly effective against animals, which saves precious ammo early. Where some animals take a full clip to heal, the knife does the job in one or two thrusts. But you'd never discover this if you didn't know you had a fucking knife. Obviously, I know there's a knife. I've played Stalker games for years. How does a new player learn this though? How are they introduced to the knife? Correct, they aren't. The knife has mixed results against stalkers. Unaware enemies take more damage, so a jab to the back can be deadly, but reaching them unnoticed is tricky, and armor plays a large role in how effective knife attacks are. A leather jacket won't stop much, but a metal exoskeleton with reinforced plating? Yeah, that pig sticker won't do much. Scavenging is a pillar of stalkers' enduring success. It was a fresh feature for a shooter in 2007, new and engaging, and a fun way to encourage players to explore all stalker offered. Scavenging is vital early, but never loses potency throughout the game. There's always something powerful to discover, and small advantages stack. It's one of stalkers' most rewarding systems, gifting players a sense of progression and personal improvement. Man, this feels familiar. You looking for trouble? Where encounter survival is measured in seconds, every advantage matters. Stalker has a stealth system which tracks noise and visibility. Breaking line of sight, walking on soft surfaces, moving slowly, it all counts toward remaining unnoticed. This system is a natural fit for Stalker's gameplay and the predator-prey gorilla dynamic of the zone. It's held back, however, by inconsistent results and the underpowered weapons. Sometimes enemies spot a single pixel of you, while other times they're blissfully unaware. There's no detectable rhythm, no measurable actions which yield consistent results. Every stealth attempt is a roll of the die, metaphorically and literally. There seems to be a random element to detection which is only explained with a dice roll. Sometimes the roll is high, meaning quicker detection. Sometimes it's low, meaning slower detection. Stealth systems are fun to use when they're consistent. Thief, the Dark Project, nailed this system nine years earlier and pioneered the first person sneaker. Its stealth systems were consistent, measurable, and repeatable. There were no random elements to detection, no dice rolls or sudden spikes in enemy alertness. It was built upon player-centric cause and effect. I appreciate that Stalker Stealth was designed so that players couldn't lean on it too much, or it would trivialize many encounters. But there are missions which require stealth to complete, or at least complete them without waking the entire zone. Sid offers an early mission to retrieve documents from the Southern Military Checkpoint in Cordon Region. He wants it done quietly, so that the military don't get their shits up and retaliate against Rookie Village. I feel as though this mission was supposed to showcase the stealth system and its possibilities. It achieves that in spades. The player is explicitly encouraged to use silence pistols and the knife for this mission. To be fair, the mission also states that it's easier to steal the documents after dark. I didn't do that for this playthrough, but the results were no less eye-opening. The silenced pistol suffers the same crippling flaws as other early game weapons crappy accuracy. I couldn't top a guard at a couple of meters and alerted guards take much less damage so emptying a clip into an alerted guard was useless. The knife was equally horrible. It required I be crutched to cheeks with a soldier before it would land a hit. Soldiers became alert a few steps away so this became an awkward dance of catch my blade until I was shot. That wasn't the end of the shenanigans. Game reloads do weird things to the AI. After I entered the military base unseen I made a manual save. Every time I reloaded this save from a failed stealth attempt, the AI became alert and danced around for a few minutes before settling down. I persisted, struggling to make stealth work. After much trial and error, and I do mean much, I finally killed one of the soldiers, but his companion ran off yelling. I figured that I was toast, but after a while he returned to the barracks as if nothing was wrong. No alarm, no soldiers attracted to the curioso of their dead comrade on the floor. With few options, I shot the remaining guard from cover and each time he ran off yelling, only to calmly return moments later, leaking from the new hole I created. It took almost a full clip, but I eventually killed this guard, retrieved the documents and left the compound avoiding discovery. 
Incels are more functional than this stealth system. I recall being bitterly disappointed by Stalker's stealth on release. The exclusion zone is the right environment to be skulking in the bushes, waiting for that dangerous mutant or group of stalkers to pass. But in practice, it's impossible to pull this off consistently. Stealth can work, that's the frustrating part. There are times when you're able to sneak up on enemies or circle a camp for the best vantage point or even watch from darkness as enemies wander meters from your position. Stealth is a means to an end, and that end is favorable odds. When it works, it's satisfying. When it doesn't, it's another plan that went to crap. Perhaps that's intended, but it isn't satisfying. Collectively, these are hard lessons to learn early. Much of it is in service to the reality that you ain't worth spit. Don't say it, Blondie, don't you say it. You're learning fast. Everyone doubts your ability, and your oversight and lack of knowledge is punished. Does this sound familiar? It should. From Software perfected this formula over the last decade. Bugs and oversights cause additional challenges. The most prominent one is the hangar location and garbage region, which is infamous for bandit spawns. The player must help loners defend the area against a bandit raid. Later, the loners request help to repel another bandit raid. Bandits never stop spawning, and it isn't uncommon to be fighting 15 to 20 bandits with hopelessly inaccurate weapons and little ammo. The loners frequently succumb to sheer numbers unless the player intervenes, and even then there's no guarantee they'll survive. The second defense mission is optional, but the bandits guard the only road to Agrippum region, an area critical to the early plot. Failure to wipe them out or thin the herd results in a permanent bandit checkpoint which is hard to bypass with early game equipment and which constantly regenerates. This caused frustration at release, there are numerous posts about it, and wasn't fixed in consecutive patches. I'm playing the patched GOG version and this area is still bad. Progress stopped for half an hour while I devised a way past without burning resources. Recall that I'm playing on master difficulty, which magnifies the issue. You'll likely have an easier time on lower difficulties. The random nature of spawns also dictates how difficult this section is. It's true that Stalker is inherently hostile, like Ubisoft's live service business model. While there are imbalances, oversights, and bugs which can harm the experience for new players, I offer a counter-argument. Stalker rewards knowledge and experience, and the early struggles play to that notion. An understanding of the world and the gumption to explore it are always rewarded, gifting brave stalkers new weapons and armor, powerful artifacts, and additional resources. There's a great example in the starting region, Cordon. A sawed-off shotgun sits atop a derailed train on the southern side of the tracks which bisect the region. The train is shielded by an anomaly cluster, but observant stalkers will find a path through. From there, jump to the train and retrieve the stash from the roof of the locomotive. The sword-off shotgun is a powerful weapon this early, capable of one-shotting most enemies at close range, something the player rudely discovers if a shotgun bandit catches them off guard. The moment players leave Sid's bunker, they can get this weapon. A short distance from the train, inside a tunnel guarded by a pseudo-dog, is an armoured jacket, which is a decent upgrade from the leather jacket. Both can be retrieved in less than 10 minutes of starting the game. Knowledge is power in Stalker, and it doesn't end with stashes. Stalker wants players to know how low in the pecking order they sit, and it hammers that point repeatedly. It doesn't do this to make them feel like dirt, but so they appreciate that upturn in the power curve. It's coming, and it's not as far as you think. But that'll have to wait for part two of this analysis. For those not in the know, I'm splitting future analysis videos, this one included, into parts. I'm not doing this for YouTube exposure, though it does help. I'm doing it because the turnaround for long videos is typically three to four months, which is far too long to expect my patrons to wait. These videos require significant time, effort, and research, and I don't have the same free time as more popular YouTubers. The goal is more regular video releases without compromising length or quality. I'd love your feedback, so drop a comment and tell me if you like this format. I'll refine it based on feedback. Speaking of which, a fistful of thank yous to my patrons who brought you this video. Patron support means that my cheeky is always breaky. Patrons get exclusive perks like their name in the credits, regular updates, verbal thank yous at the end of my videos, and even a bespoke copy of the script for this video as a way of saying thanks. If you'd like to see your name here or want to support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. A link to my long play channel, Blondfire, is also in the description, if you like that sort of thing. I have two Stalker long plays on Blondfire, with more Stalker content planned once the Valheim long play is done, including Stalker 2 when it releases. A big thanks to the Primordial Chronicles, aka Mr. Shkotsky, for the Demon Souls footage. He runs a YouTube channel that you should check out, link in the description. 
If you enjoyed this video, then take a sword off to the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the dingaling so that you're notified when part two of this analysis drops. If and you'd be so kind, throw the Blondie experience into the nearest anomaly and let it explode across this expansive wasteland. Remember the cant. Sharing the video helps, you know it. Until part two, partners.